Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants session. Today, we're so lucky to be hanging out with Meg Lauman from the California Academy of Sciences. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Joe Grabowski. I'm the founder of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and I'm also a grade uh, six, seven teacher in Guelph, Ontario. And uh, yeah, this is what this is all about, connecting classrooms around the world to science, adventure, conservation, and uh, busy day today. This is our third session. We've already been in the UK and in South Africa, so uh, very excited to get this one going. So just introduce Meg quickly. She's a biologist, an ecologist, editor, writer, and a public speaker. She's spent years studying life uh, high up in the canopy of the rainforest. Um, she's the Chief of Science and Sustainability at the California Academy of Sciences. And Meg, it is so great to have you today. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Well, hi kids. I am so happy to be here. Hey, raise your hand if you ever climbed a tree before. Oh, goody. How about you, Mr. Joe? Oh, lots of trees. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I just want to tell all you guys, this is kind of neat, but you know, people who study in outer space are called astronauts. And scientists who study the tops of trees, like me, are called arbor knots, because that word arbor means tree. And I was, I guess, kind of the first arbor knot in the world. It's a little crazy, but when I was a student, I got a helmet like this, and I put it on, and I actually got a slingshot like this, and I shot a string over a tree trunk branch up in the canopy and I climbed up with a rope and when I did that and I got to the top I found out that it's amazing but something like 50 percent of the world's creatures live in the top of a tree so that's really awesome it means if you walk on the ground you're not seeing about 50 percent of species that live in the top of the tree so insects birds animals a lot of snakes can you believe some snakes can even sail between trees because they have sort of an ability to adjust their scales and all sorts of cool things like even some animals climb up in the tree so there's all kinds of things up there and so I became an arbor knot and now I'm a scientist that's actually doing more work trying to save trees than discover trees and do you know why what's happening to forests does anybody know what's happening to forests you can probably think about that you can shout it out a little bit to your teacher Probably you all know, yep, tree logging, clearing, burning, all sorts of things are happening to the forest. So right now it's really important that we plant trees and we do things to help save trees. But the reason I love forests is there are all sorts of cool things up there. Um, for example, here's a new species of beetle. And guess what? My son James, when he was eight years old, he discovered this up in the top of the tree, climbing with his mom. So there's lots of things that you could probably discover in the treetops if you're able to get a little project going. And here's another cool, wonderful thing. This is actually a stuffed animal, but it's a replicate of a very cool thing called a water bear. And if you Google water bears after this little by the seat of your pants talk, you'll be able to see they're the most extreme organism in the planet. They can go into outer space, they can live in the top of a tree, they're really small, about 10 can live on my little finger, but they're able to do really extreme cool things. So the canopy has all sorts of really important stuff up there that we all love. They also have things like medicines. Here's a medicine that they use in the Amazon jungle to cure arthritis for older people. And they also do really cool things like here's a blowgun that was made out of a rainforest tree and they use these darts, of course, to catch their food for dinner down in the Amazon. Maybe they're going to very sustainably go hunting for things like capybaras and monkeys and so they 
actually make their living from everything up in the treetop. So it's a really awesome thing to study the forest canopy. And if anybody likes climbing, you guys ought to keep that in mind because right now there's a lot of forests that have never even been explored. And some of my students discovered eight new species living in the tops of oak trees down here in California. So there's a lot of opportunity for young people to make exploration in the treetops, for new discoveries, and most importantly, we now know that trees keep us alive. Without trees, we're all going to be dead, unfortunately. They give us oxygen and fresh water, and they help control our climate, and they even take in pollution, as well as cool things like medicines and other cool things like biodiversity that lives up there. So forests really are like this great big machine that's keeping the planet healthy, and being a forest scientist is is really fun because you get to go out and explore new places, and it's also really important for the health of people and the health of our planet. So with that, Mr. Joe, by the seat of your pants, um, I can go back to you and maybe we can have a few questions that kids might want to learn about canopies. Sure, absolutely. Before we do start jumping to some classrooms, can I, I have to ask, the number one comment I've got so far is up on our page, we shared a video um, of the blimp that you were using to explore the canopy. Can you tell us a little bit about that, where the idea came from, and just uh, what it was like? Yeah, sure. In fact, I'll just give you a little rundown of my toolkit, um, because the first thing that I ever used to climb trees, and I, as I said, I was one of the first people to do this, was a rope and my slingshot and my helmet. And then everybody got excited because there were so many cool things up there. So the second tool was building bridges or canopy walkways and tree platforms, which are really awesome because you can take 10 people up at once and you can't do that with a rope. And I actually built the first one in Australia and then I built the first one in North America in Massachusetts, believe it or not, when I came back to the States. So check them out. There's probably one in Canada. I know there's one in Vancouver. Maybe there's one near you. Um, but the third tool that was so awesome is the hot air balloon and that canopy raft, which is a big red inflatable cool device that's very lightweight so it can rest on the tops of the trees. And the hot air balloon can float us around to do things like measure gas in the atmosphere or measure little spiders wafting through the breeze and the actual raft itself we can live up there we can sample up there and these two inflatables were actually designed by some French people and I was part of the team that explores with them there's about 50 of us that have gone to different tropical rainforests that are really tall and hard to climb but when we settle our raft on the top of the canopy then we're right there where we want to be. Yep, and that was a cool TV show that National Geographic made called Heroes of the High Frontier because a lot of people call the treetops the high frontier, kind of like a cowboy, I guess. Yeah, I just actually, because some classes might not or some of the viewers might not have seen a little clip, I just pulled up a YouTube clip on my side, so I'm going to share that really quickly with the people. Cool, who are watching great, because so it's yeah. so much fun. It's like the Wizard of Oz or something. There we go. Let me just switch to share screen, and you can get uh, a look at it, just in case you haven't had a chance to see the the clip before. Did that work, May? Can you see the YouTube page I now? Can. That's fantastic. And also, you, um, for the teachers, they could go on my website, which is www.canopymeg.com, and there's a couple videos of different tools that we use in the canopy in case they want to do a little extra after this. All right. Here comes the video. Suspended beneath is the canopy luge, a sled bearing excited researchers on the trip of their lives. Among them is one of the founders of the field, Meg Lowman, who's explored canopies the world over. But today, she goes where no one has gone before. Their mission? to trawl the green sea of the canopy to get some inkling of the biological riches it contains.
The blimp maneuvers the luge carefully, sidling up to a tree crown 150 feet in the air. As soon as they are close enough to reach, nets are wielded frantically. They scoop up insects and collect whole branches in an all-out effort to gather as many samples of canopy life as quickly as they can. It would have taken weeks of difficult and dangerous climbing to get the samples they amass in just one morning on the beach. Okay. Okay, so Meg, I imagine there's no fear of heights on your side. <laughs> well, I call it a respect for heights. I always love to be on the ground, but um, it's really fun to climb. It does require a lot of safety, so that's why I call it respect for heights. You know, there's no, uh, you can't make a boo-boo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, yeah, let's, let's meet some of our classrooms. So let's start off with, we have uh, Mrs. Radomski's and Miss Romick's grade two class at St. Anne Elementary and they're here in Canada and Alberta so let me turn their mic on they can say hi. How's it going guys? Hey. Hello. I wonder if anybody there might have a question or two for Canopy Meg. Anybody have a question? Chase, why don't you come stand up here by the camera? Speak into the camera. Um, what kind of animal, do you see any animals in there at the um, Do you study Amazon? animals as well? Absolutely. And two of my favorites are in Australia, the koala bear always lives in the canopy and eats leaves. And the other real, real species is the sloth, which lives in the Amazon rainforest. And sloths also eat leaves, which is pretty darn fun. And one of my students is studying sloths. And guess what? Sloths go down the tree once a week to poop. And they, otherwise, they never go to the forest floor. So he's studying why would a sloth go down on the forest floor to poop? Because it's a little dangerous down there. You can get eaten by a jaguar. So maybe next year we'll post the answer on my website. Excellent. We have another question. Um, Maria. Oh, thank you, Chase. Stand up right there. Right there, you're good. There you go. Nice big loud voice. Okay. Um, how long have you been exploring? Oh, great question. You know, I first started making little tree forts when I was three years old. So I guess I always liked playing outdoors, and but I didn't really become a scientist until. I went to college and then I learned about things like bugs and birds and monkeys and I got really interested in exploring how in the heck do all these things live in the forest and the trees still stay healthy. So ever since I guess I was 20 years old I've been exploring around the world a little bit. Great question. Let's steal you know, one more from the grade two class and we'll need some more other classes. Maybe we can email them too. Come back here. Or at least we can see your head's cut off already, crouched down. <laughs> there you go. Okay, ask your question. How do you feel about being a scientist? Oh, cool question. So two things that I'm going to tell you especially is one is that um, being a woman scientist sometimes is a little scary because still there's a lot more boys than girls in science. So I'm excited if some of you girls decide to be scientists. And number two is I think right now in the world where we have a lot of people, like seven billion people on the planet. It's really important that everybody understands science because science is what keeps us healthy. It helps us understand fresh water and it helps us understand sometimes when we get bitten by an insect we might catch a disease or maybe it helps us understand where our food comes from. So science is really cool. I hope all of you guys are going to study science and maybe a few of you will actually become a scientist which is a really really fun job to have. Thanks. All right, great questions. Hope maybe we'll have time to swing back um, for a couple more, but let's meet another class. We have Miss um, Farouk's period four biology. They're grade 12 students Hi. from the American School Foundation of Monterey, and they're 
in Mexico. So right across North America today. Who's gonna ask? All right, who has a question? Your face right down there. Here she comes. All right. Yes. Hi. <laughs> I wanted to know. Uh, you mentioned that your students and you you found new species in the canopies. How do you do that? You just like catch them, or uh, how do you identify that they are new species? Right. What a great question. It's not easy always. There's a couple things though when you think about this. If you climb a great big tall tree in a place like the remote Amazon rainforest of Peru, you can be pretty sure that nobody's been up there before. So that means a lot of things are new. But technically to confirm that it's new, we always consult the expert. So in the case of this little um, beetle that I mentioned um, that was new, we had to mail it to one of the experts of Coleoptera, which is the group of beetles at the Smithsonian, and then he would check it against the reference collection. And similarly, we have a big collection here at the California Academy of Sciences. We have 46 million things in the collection. So a lot of times if people say find a new plant in the Philippines, they'll come here because we have a lot of plants from the Philippines. So as a scientist, I always have to check the records that are in the collections of museums around the world to confirm that it is a new species. And that's why it's a little slow. Sometimes that takes a year or two to make that confirmation. And that's a little bit disappointing because in certain places in the world, the rainforests are disappearing quicker than we can discover the new species. And so in the world of conservation, we're trying hard to save the forests first and then name the new species second. Thanks. Anyone else in here with a question? That was a great question. <laughs> Come on back. <laughs> um, you, you just look at my camera, right? You'll be there, um, trust me. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that there is like, because of deforestation, we need to like plant more trees and save more trees. But uh, like, what things would you recommend to save? Okay, what a great question. It's so tricky because, you know, when we do lose a really old, beautiful forest, it's, we can't get it back because the insects disappear, the pollinators disappear. Um, we do know two things. One is we should try to save the older forests or harvest them very sustainably so that we never lose the canopy. <clears throat> and number two, if we do have deforestation, the best thing we can do to recreate things like shade and oxygen and holding the soil in place is to plant trees and allow the forest restoration processes to occur. But that's a whole new field as well. The whole business of how forests restore themselves or grow back is another kind of unknown field of science and we're still learning a lot about that because in some cases it takes hundreds of years for example for jaguars to come back. It might take hundreds of years for parrots to come back in a forest canopy after the area has been logged. So a lot of these questions are really challenging and I think the best thing we can all do is learn a lot about the importance of forest and buy timber that comes from plantations, make sure that we don't buy beef that comes from areas that have been cleared in the tropics for cattle and even things like coffee, if we buy it when it's grown in the shade of a rainforest instead of a cleared sunny area, we're really helping the planet just by our shopping habits. Okay, great questions, great answers. Let's meet another one of our high school classes. So we have um, Mrs. Malloy's grade 12 environmental biology class from La Academia at the Denver Inner City Parish. So let me turn your mic on. And if you have some questions, now's the time. Hey there. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Hi. This question. I was, I was um, seeing the video. I watched the video and it said that the forest had a, the forest floor had a forest soil. So uh, if we could explain a bit more. Yeah, that's a really good 
observation for you to pick that up. This is really amazing, but most tropical forests have a lot of their nutrition in the canopy. It's the leaves and the flowers and the above ground tree trunks that have all the nutrition. So if a forest is burned or if it's actually cleared and dragged away like it might be for logging, all of those nutrients go somewhere else and sometimes they even go in the atmosphere and fall into the ocean. So that means the soil has no more ability to get the nutrients back. So that's a really disappointing thing and when people first went to the tropics, say in the 19 50s and saw those huge trees in the Amazon they said wow we want to cut all this down and plant corn and plant soy because the soils must be so amazingly rich but unfortunately that wasn't true when they got rid of all of the um, what they call biomass the tree that lived above the ground by hauling it away the soil didn't have any nutrients left so that was why a lot of tropical areas don't have such good crops anymore there's one or two tropical forests in the world Australia for example has pretty good soils because there were volcanoes there originally so there's a few rainforests that are exception to that rule but a lot of them unfortunately do have poor soils and most of the nutrition is above the ground. Thank you. Great question. And yeah, maybe one more gosh. before we meet another class. Another one? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was wondering how many species of animals and insects are currently discovered in the Amazon. Oh my gosh, how cool is that? You want to come with me? <laughs> Um, so right now, can you believe this? We have gone to the moon, we've gone to the bottom of the deepest ocean, but we still don't know how many species exist in a tree. So we have a lot of things to learn. We think there could be 10 million or there could be 100 million. So that's a pretty big difference. But what we do know is that we've discovered about one and a half million species in the whole planet. And we know that probably the Amazon has about half of them. So that means probably 500,000 to 700,000 species have been classified in the Amazon. And we know that there's at least three or four times more than that amount yet to discover. So it's really crazy that we don't know any more than that. But it's also kind of exciting for you guys to think about the fact that there's so much left out there to discover. Thanks. That's right. So anybody there wondering what maybe they want to do in sciences, there's so much to look at. I'm going to duck back to our grade two class just because I know we want to keep them engaged. <laughs> they have another question for us. So, Dana, uh, Thank you. Hey, Alex, come over here. Hey, Alex, come over here. Have you seen pink dolphins? What? Have I seen pink dolphins? Yes! They are so cool. I have seen them almost every time I go to the Amazon I've seen them. And they're really beautiful and they're really gentle. Usually they even come up and swim around the boat because they just are not afraid of people, which is amazing. And they're kind of sacred. Nobody hunts them or hurts them in the Amazon villages. They love the pink dolphins. So that's a really nice thing. Thanks. Great question. We're going to jump to my class now. We're a grade 7 class in Guelph, Ontario. And it looks like we have a couple questions. Do you want to come up first, Giselle? Sure. All right, come on up. Yeah, it's on. Hi. Hey. Um, what is the smallest insect in the rain Amazon rainforest? Oh, my gosh. First of all, we probably don't know because the small things are the hardest to find. But you know what? This little creature that I showed you in a big stuffed animal called a water bear is really small. So there's a whole bunch of what we call micro arthropods that are tiny, tiny, tiny. And as we get more technology, we discover more. Do you know we found these in every single tree? 
in the Amazon. So that shows you, and you probably never even heard of them practically. And no. even more, we think they even they live in drops of water. So they're probably in your lettuce. They're probably in your broccoli. They're probably in everything you eat that's green that gets washed. So we're discovering that some little tiny things are really common, and we never knew that before. And there's probably going to be more um, little tiny nematodes, even little bacteria, as we start to study more things that live in the canopy, I bet we'll find tinier, tidier things. So it's a whole new world. Thanks. Thank you. Great question, Giselle. Come on up, Frankie. Or you can look at the camera. <laughs> Uh, what's your favorite thing that you've discovered? So your oh, favorite. wow, how cool. My favorite thing that I've discovered, um, oh. probably, well, I do love this little brown beetle, mainly because you know what I did? I went online and had a naming contest, and a girl in fifth grade won the contest. So that was really fun to do. But it's a pretty boring looking beetle, but it's also really important because it eats a lot of things in the Amazon tree canopy. It eats bromeliads especially. But maybe my favorite thing that I've sort of discovered really has been the canopy walkway. To build these walkways as a new invention was pretty exciting because now they use them in a lot of countries to save the forest. They actually build them and charge people money to go on them. It's called ecotourism. So tourists like to go in these canopy walkways and I'm really happy because they're using them for income. Instead of cutting the trees down and selling them, they're saving the trees and letting people see the canopy. So I really think that's kind of cool. Thanks. Okay. So we'll swing back in a moment, but we have one more class to meet. Uh, let me turn on their microphone. So. Mrs. Ort's environmental science class from Hoover High School in Alabama. They just got in under the radar with an email last night, so I was able to fit them in. So thanks for joining us today. Yay, we're here. Hey, guys. Hi. Yay, I love Alabama. I used to work in Florida a lot. Right. Here, Alabama. We know a lot of the same people, too. <laughs> All right. I spent a lot of time down at Explorama. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I'm so homesick now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. I've seen your work at a distance, so. Oh. Any questions? What? Oh, yeah. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like your hair. Well, I did watch your two-minute video last night, and from that link that Ms. Orr sent me on the Google Classroom, and it does, it wonders me that to watch you like walk on top of the trees and I would like to know what was it like like walking on the trees? Cool question. You know, it's amazing. I mean you sort of lose your fear. You forget where the ground is and that it's so far away. So it feels pretty magical because in a way that's the closest I can be to being a butterfly or a beetle or a dragonfly. And as long as I don't get too heavy in one place and maybe break the little branches. I can get around a lot on that treetop canopy inflatable and I can study a lot of things quicker than I can by using my slingshot and climbing up by the rope. So it's a really fantastic privilege. I suppose it's the closest I'll come to walking in space, right? <laughs> Thanks. You gotta come with me. Have you been down there? We're working on that again. <laughs> oh great. Well let me know. We'd love to share data. Okay, it's a deal. Yeah, okay, good. All right, um, I was curious on how much it costs to fund your expedition. Right, so every time we travel it costs something, and I do spend quite a bit of my time writing grants and fundraising a lot for forest conservation, and an expedition can cost as much as a million dollars when 50 people take that hot air balloon with a whole team of engineers to fly it over the Amazon or it can cost as little as five thousand dollars when I go to Ethiopia and I'm taking um, books and I'm taking um, kind of workshops mm -hmm. to the kids in the rural villages there I don't need much of anything except just a couple duffel bags and 
maybe a little laptop that I plug into a generator. So it's really ranges a lot depending on the people in the place and the equipment that we need to take. When we take a whole bunch of equipment and gear, it obviously costs more to get it there. When we can be a little independent and just take one rope and one slingshot, we can make it pretty cheap. Great questions. I'm going to swing back now to our grade twos, um, and then we'll visit our high school classes again, because I'm sure there's a couple more questions. But I want to keep um, our grade twos in the Big loud voice. How did you find birds? Uh, her question was, how, what, how do you catch all the bugs? What are the different ways you catch them? Oh, right. So there's a whole toolkit for finding all these different creatures in the canopy. And so for finding insects and bugs, for example, we use a net sometimes. We use sometimes little traps where things fly in and then they fall down into our buckets. And sometimes we use a little kind of thing like a straw where we suck the insect off the tree bark or off the leaf surface. Sometimes we take a big plastic bag and we just put branches inside of it and we shake it and all the insects fall into the bag. So there's a whole bunch of ways that we use to sample in the canopy and each time we take all those with us depending on what we want to sample. It's really, really fun to figure out how to catch all the different kinds of insects. Thanks. Okay, and then maybe, because we have them on the line, one more question if there's another one. Okay, uh, Samaratu. Okay, big loud voice right there, honey. What are we doing? How many creatures do you catch a day? Oh my gosh, what a cool question. So you know what, some days when we do a lot of sampling, we probably catch maybe 50,000 creatures. We can catch a whole lot in a net or in some of our traps. And other days, guess what? If it's raining, we might only catch 10 because a lot of insects don't like to go out in the rain. So we have to be really careful about our planning to make sure we have enough room to sample all those creatures and count them at the end of the day. But also, here's another little secret. Sometimes more insects are active at night because then they won't get eaten by birds. So sometimes we sample at night and find even more things than we do in the day. Thanks. Great questions from Alberta. Uh, I just want to take a moment now to mention that next Monday, so the 21st, we have a really cool hangout coming up with Untamed Science and another scientist from the California Academy of Sciences and they're looking at the biodiversity of bugs found in your home on all seven continents. So um, they've done three so far. I believe they were just recently down in the Amazon. And uh, that's going to be another really cool session if you want to continue learning a bit more about uh, biodiversity um, as well as the seven continents. So another cool opportunity from the Cal Academy. Great. Um, let's see. Let's go to... To Mexico to Miss Farouk's class. You guys have another question for Meg? Okay. Um, hi. Thank you for doing this. It's been really interesting, and I was just wondering how can you ensure the safety of both the wildlife and the trees, seeing as they're they are very fragile. Right, that's such a great question. And it's always tricky when you're a scientist working in such a beautiful place as a forest. First of all, when we build canopy walkways, we obviously affect a few things. We know that more people are coming into the canopy, and it probably scares off a few of the birds and some of the monkeys. But of course, it doesn't affect the insects because they don't really care if there's people walking by their leaf. And it probably doesn't affect a lot of the things like the little things living in the bromeliad tanks. So the best we can do is to know that by creating our research, by finding out and discovering how the forest works, we're doing a bigger service to keeping the forest healthy than if it gets cut down altogether. So we just have to do our best. The other thing we do is we never sample 
birds or mammals or anything that could be rare because that wouldn't be a good way for us to keep the forest healthy. So thanks for asking that great question. Yeah, that was a great question. Uh, one more, maybe? Hey, thanks a lot for doing this. And I wanted, <laughs> and I wanted to ask, like, what measurements can you take to avoid hurting the insects, or when you take them back to the states to inspect them? Like, are they still alive, or do you, or, or do you put them in some oil and? Right. So two things. That's a cool question. Number one is, I'm really a forest conservation biologist now, so a lot of times I don't take anything. I just count things and release them again because I'm sort of interested, for example, in how many pollinators there are and how many insects are eating leaves and things like that. But when I'm with an expedition that is collecting, first and foremost, we have to have a permit. We have to apply for a permit from the country and we have to have some good scientific purpose for our expedition and usually we partner with people that are living in the same country so if I were studying forests in Mexico which I have done at times I would partner with some of my colleagues that are forest scientists in Mexico and I might even leave the insects there and work on them down there or maybe bring a small amount back to the California Academy and for people that do collect a lot um, they usually have a couple techniques some insects do well if you just dry them other insects with thicker bodies are better if you put them in alcohol and similarly with animals they usually have to skin the animal and do certain things to allow them to be transported without rotting or harming the actual body of the animal. So there's a lot of tricks of the trade for sampling different kinds of things. For plants, maybe it's the easiest because you can press them and dry them and bring them back between pieces of cardboard and that makes it really kind of simple. Cool question. Oh, the questions have been great so far from grade 2 right through to grade 12. So it's, it's been an awesome session so far. Just to any classes who might be running tight on time, if you do have to log off, feel free. It won't affect the, the call at all. But um, let's move on to, we'll do a few more questions. I want to make sure I get the last couple groups again. So maybe there's a question from my class, from the grade 7 class. Jeremy, you want to come up? Right in the camera, bud. Hey. Go ahead, bud. Nice and loud. How many animals have you seen in the Amazon, like different types of animals, any type? Oh, my gosh. What a cool question. How many animals? That is a really tough question. You know, there are fewer mammals, if you want to be technical about animals, of course, than there are insects. There are, you know, thousands of mammals, but there are millions of insects. So I've seen fewer mammals because they're very shy, but I've certainly seen hundreds and hundreds of species of mammals in all of the forests I've worked at around the world. The other thing that's really a little sad is that mostly in rainforests that are getting uh, logged, the, the mammals and animals disappear first because they're the ones that get hunted. So they're the rare species and we have to watch out for them. Goodbye grade two, I see they're leaving. Got a message, yep. No problem. So anyway, thanks for that question. Bye bye. Okay. Uh, yep, yeah, there they go. So they were great. They sat really still. They asked some great questions. So nope. can't ask cool. for anything more than that. But just along the line of Jeremy's question, I know you've seen a lot, but do you have a bucket list species? Is there something that's eluded you to this stage? Is there something yeah. you're looking for? Um, well, the spectacled bear I really want to see. And um, just because it's kind of cool, down in Peru would be wonderful. That tends to live in some of the higher mountain, tropical mountainous areas of rainforest, so that would be cool. I've heard a jaguar, but I've never seen one. I think I'd be really scared if I confront the jaguar in front of me on the trail, but I sure would love to see one up close. And um, they sometimes are, you know, at night making a lot of noise around us, so that would be fun. And um, so those are the two on my bucket list for now. Um, unfortunately, in Africa, where I do a bit of work, there aren't 
many mammals left in a lot of the rainforest areas and they're declining and that's really sad so it's not like I should expect to see some of the things that used to live there in the past like the hyena in Ethiopia is supposed to be really special but you know their populations are quite threatened okay just awesome I can I can only imagine the bank of stories you have and the experiences <laughs> from your work it's wow just incredible I just saw a message from Mrs. Ort's class. Some might have to leave shortly, so let's switch over and, and snag another question from them before they have to go. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to know how often you travel in like a year or a week or whatever to talk. Right. I could probably travel every day. I wished I could, but I have to also do my job here at the academy, which involves sitting at a desk sometimes. How awful but true. Um, so what I try to do is focus now that I'm kind of in middle career, I really look at the forests that seem to be the most urgent. So I'm traveling about twice a year to Ethiopia and once a year to the Amazon and I'm trying to work some in India as well. But for example, the forests of Costa Rica are in pretty good shape and the forests of Panama are in pretty good shape. So I don't tend to travel to those even though I used to. Um, so that's kind of how I organize it. Um, I'm hoping to go to Borneo next month because there's a big conference on saving the forests of Borneo. And sometimes I try to do something on the quick because you know, when you get more voices in the room, you might have more chance for better conservation. Thanks for asking. Yes, ma'am. Okay, maybe one more. Okay, this is kind of a question for Ms. Ort, but um, which project are you most passionate about, or the one that you've done? Okay, so right now I guess I'm most passionate about Ethiopia and again you can go on my website and see some of the films from that and that's because less than 5% of their forests are left in northern Ethiopia. So it's so urgent. They're probably going to disappear in 10 years if we don't focus on them. So that means a lot to me to try to help help them with their conservation programs and help educate the kids about all the cool things that the forests do for them like providing their fresh water and so Ethiopia wins at the top of my list thanks okay so uh, Mrs. Malloy's class we haven't forgotten about you in Denver let's get a couple more questions maybe to to start wrapping up hi hi my question is I was watching the video and it said that um, pavilion trees can withstand more than other trees can. Why is that? Um, can't wait, can you say that just a little bit again? Um, how come pav pavilion trees can withstand more than other trees can? Pavilion trees? Yeah. Um, well, I think what you mean is the really amazing emergent big trees. You know, they have a much more resilient system. They have roots that go a lot further to get water and they have of course a canopy that's making a lot more energy because every time they produce an extra leaf they get more photosynthesis. So anytime you have more green and you have more roots you're gonna win and believe it or not there's a big war going on in the rainforest where everybody is competing for light and for water even though you wouldn't think so because there's so much rain there's still a lot of plants and they all want to get the same drops of water so if you have better roots and better leaves you're gonna win the battle thank you thanks okay one more yeah um I have a question that we've been talking about in our class, and it's a pretty broad question, but I'd like to hear your opinion. Um, why is it important to study the rainforest? That is a great question, because for a lot of people, they don't even live within a thousand miles of a rainforest, so they probably say, why should I bother? All I need to worry about is going to Walmart after school and buying my water in a bottle. <laughs> um, believe it or not, it's the same. If you lived in a high-rise building, you might have your heat and your air conditioners in the basement of the building. The rainforest is like this amazing machine that's really keeping the planet healthy. And it does so much while we sleep and even when we're far away. That Amazon 
basin, for example, is doing a lot to impact the actual currents over the Pacific Ocean, which in turn affect our rainfall patterns here in California. And when we lose trees in the Amazon, all of that soil rushes out into the Atlantic Ocean and affects coral reefs and affects ocean currents. So there's just a huge amount of connectivity. And with all those millions of species, as I mentioned, living in the rainforest, it's kind of like our great big library. And we could burn our library down but maybe we're going to lose a medicine, maybe we're going to lose an important tropical fruit that in the future is going to be really important for some element of human health. So it's kind of like, why should we shoot ourselves in the foot, as they say? Um, you know, why not protect something that we know is so important and just give it a little attention? Um, so that's, I hope that helps you a little bit, because that's a really great and huge question. Thank you. So maybe just as we're wrapping up, something that I was just thinking about now, one of my favorite documentaries is David Attenborough's Private Life of Plants. Do you ever get to work on documentaries from time to time? Um, I do. That National Geographic was a documentary, of course. And when I was living in Rainforest, when I lived in Australia, I did work a little bit with David Attenborough and kind of helped to find sites. Right now, we're working on a documentary about the Ethiopian forests, and hopefully that'll get done by next year. So I promise I'll let you know. You can air it on your show. Very cool. Yeah. Well, Meg, Meg I, I can't thank you enough. This has been an awesome session. I'm so excited we had such a diverse group across North America. Um, Neat. Fantastic. It, uh, yeah, it went really well. The technology I see Alabama is leaving me a question. If anybody wants to send me a question, they can just send my website, www.canopymag.com, and I, can, I promise I'll answer. Like, they wanted a few ideas about labs, about mm -hmm. rainforests, and I'd be happy to correspond with the teachers about that. Amazing. Well, again, thank you so much. I hope... Um, we can have you in the future again on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, maybe after one of your next trips. Fantastic. Yeah, maybe after Ethiopia. I'm going over in January, so keep yeah, in touch. Awesome. Yeah, tell us a little bit about it. Um, I'm going to turn the mics on one more time so all the classrooms can say thank you and goodbye, so it might get a little bit loud. Okay. But, um, <laughs> after I go off air, if you just want to stick around for another moment, and then, uh, yeah, well, thank you so much. It was awesome. Thanks for thank joining you. the adventure. All right, turning on the mics. Bye. Okay.